Hi, everyone. Good morning. Um, uh, I'm Thomas Stewart from the Mentor Initiative, uh, one of the program managers. Um, so I'm here to talk about how we use communication to build capacity within local settings. We're an organisation that saves lives in emergencies by providing tropical disease control. And we make sure that we, um, we do so by staying with the community after the disaster to rebuild with dignity and respect. And we always make sure that we work with the local communities, with the local health facilities and with the local governments to ensure that our impact is a sustainable and lasting one. Um, I thought I'd start with a message from our CEO, who sadly can't be with us today, um, on how we feel about neglected tropical diseases, and then I'll go further into how we use communication to build capacity within these kind of settings. So, what I'm going to talk about now is basically how we use communication strategies within our work, and how communication strategies are as important in humanitarian crises as they are in development settings. Um, In 2004, as the video will show now, um, a devastating earthquake off the coast of Sumatra in Indonesia caused nearly 200,000 deaths within 30 minutes. The ensuing rainy seasons afterwards, the, well, the predicted rainy season that was going to come afterwards, left hundreds of, thousands, hundreds of thousands of people at risk of malaria and dengue fever. And it happened at one of the most productive days in the calendar Boxing Day. So, what do you do in this awful situation when you've got hundreds of thousands of people in need? So what we did is that we work, started working collaboratively with other, NG, other NGOs and other organisations in the local public health department to produce a rapid malaria and dengue fever response. Now the first thing I want to talk about, or the first thing I want to emphasise about communication is that communication and collaboration between national partners and international partners is key to any humanitarian crisis. Within 24, 48 hours, we'd already formed a collaboration within, with, it, with 60 different NGOs to deliver essential support. And we were the malaria and dengue fever arm of that response. We worked to provide essential <coughs> malaria treatments, essential diagnostic testing, but more importantly for this scenario, we, we worked to train the local health force in how to diagnose malaria, how to diagnose dengue fever, and how to treat these. And we set up rapid training sessions and we worked collaboratively with other organisations to help deliver our commodities so that within all 21 provinces, within a couple of weeks, we had commodities on the ground so that local clinicians, local staff, trained by us with commodities delivered by the people, could start treating malaria, could start treating dengue fever. And within a few weeks, we would made sure that we, up to, so up to 700,000 people were protected from malaria and dengue fever through things like IRS and Lava siding. So, we also. Okay, there's another video which so uh, fingers crossed. Um, moving on to other situations, this is South Sudan. Um, and as you will all know, South Sudan is one of the most, or well, the most fragile country in the world. It has over 200, 2 million people that are internally displaced. And the second key concept within the communication that I want to bring to you is that as in development settings, in humanitarian crises, it's as important to educate from the ground up and to make sure that in these settings that the work you're doing is, is spread by the local community. And the way we do that in all of our campaigns is that we train community health educators, regardless of the situation, so that the local people can educate their peers, their colleagues, on what the disease is that we're trying to treat, why we're there, why the tools we're using are effective, and what they can do to mitigate the risks of deaths or morbidity from the disease. And we've been working in South Sudan since 2012 in their, mal in their malaria response in trying to help them be, do better at treating malaria or like even give them the capacity to treat malaria. But one of the core tenets we do, as well as um, provide emergency disease response is that we help the humanitarian com community as a whole be better at dealing with humanitarian, uh, sorry, be better at dealing with tropical diseases. So training is a massive part of what we do and we have an integrated vector management handbook that we train other people from other organisations on our annual training programmes. But what we did in South Sudan is as well as our malaria efforts, we worked, the South Sudanese government came to us and said when there was a cholera epidemic in 2016, and they wanted us to help them train community health educators. 
And what we went is, what we did is, on the ground, we went in and trained 110 community educators on cholera, how it was treated, um, how it was spread, and we do all this with a very rapid time frame. And so this, we really embody, we really kind of emphasise that commu educating communities from the ground up is one of the core things that we do, and that is important in humanitarian crises. Um, as you would have seen from the video, but didn't, um, we also work in Syria. Um, Syria is currently experiencing the worst humanitarian crisis since World War II. As you can see, the ongoing conflict has created absolute devastation across the country. And what, me what many of you will probably also know is that this kind of setting is the perfect breeding ground for sand flies. And as the vet was increased, a disease that we'd forgotten about in many areas of the world, leishmaniasis, has become, in some parts of Syria, the most common infectious disease. So we've been working with the Syrian government for, since 2013 to provide protect, prevention campaigns and to protect people from leishmaniasis. And one of the core tenets of anything we do with the Mentor is that we provide information education campaigns as well as training local community health educators. We provide information and education campaigns to the community to educate the community on how diseases are spread and how what we're doing is work was effective and how we can get them engaged in our prevention efforts. But how do you do so when you, this is your setting, when this is your background? How do you do so when your infrastructure is completely gone? We worked, and we worked with the local community, we figured out what is the central fulcrum of these communities? What, where, do, where does everyone gather? Where does everyone, where can we get a message out to all these people? And we realized it was the mosques. So we realized that through communicating through the mosques, through Friday prayers, leaflets delivered through Friday prayers and, and radio broadcasts on the mosques, we could reach the central community, we could reach the, commun we reach the communities despite all the devastation. So it really matters in humanitarian crises how you communicate your messages. The channels you use are almost as important as how, what messages you, promote, you are trying to promote. Um, so finally, I just want to move on to something we did last year in northern Kenya. So this is a pastoralist from the northern Kenya. And as many of you will probably know that the Horn of Kenya, including this area, has experienced recurring droughts that are worse and worse year on year. And last year, nutritional surveys showed that 30% of this population were malnourished. And as most of you will know as well, that if you're malnourished, you're much more susceptible to malaria, much, much more susceptible to die from malaria. So as the rains came in, as we predicted, the surge of malaria cases was rampant. And on behalf of UNICEF, we, entered, we, we did a rapid malaria um, prevention campaign that predicted a quarter of a million people in seven weeks. But as a core tenet of that campaign, what we did was this information education campaign, again to the local population, um, on what malaria is, how it's treated, where you can get help, and we trained the local population, the community health educators that we always do. But the key message here is that the messages we used for some people in Takana was different from the messages we used in other people in Takana. Half of the people were from Marsapit, half of the people were from Takana. One is a uh, Christian, or Christian background, one is a Muslim background. And so the flyers we used, the materials we used, the radio messages we used were different. So going so far down into the flyers we used, had for the people in, in, Mar in Marsapit, they had headscarves on in the flyers. So it's kind of re you've got to make sure that your messages are culturally appropriate. These are commonly overthought in humanitarian crises, but they really matter. As important as they are to development settings, they are as important to, to um, humanitarian crises as well. So, so um, I just want to summarise now but in saying that in humanitarian crises, despite everything that's going on, despite the devastation you see in Syria, despite the devastation you see that you saw in the Indonesian um, tsunami, it really important, it's really important how you say what you're trying to say, which channels you use, which communication uh, so which, which, how you're collaborating and working with the or other organisations, but also that you educate and you bring in from the beginning communities from the ground up. Thank you.